Dinesh D'Souza has resigned as president of New York's King's College after public revelations that the outspoken conservative is having an extramarital affair, or to be more precise, being engaged while still married to his wife. The Board of Trustees at the Evangelical King's College accepted D'Souza's resignation on October 18th. Interim President Andy Mills made the announcement stating that God has a mighty future for Dinesh, but there are some things that he has to go through first. D'Souza's apparent confusion over Christian dogma concerning the rules of marriage highlights his hypocritical behavior. D'Souza has admitted that he spent the night with his new fiancé while still being married to his wife of 20 years. It seems like an obvious problem to most, but not to D'Souza, who at first denied even being in the same hotel room with his new love. According to the Christian Post, D'Souza asserted that he had clearly told event organizer Alex McFarland that Denise and I stayed in separate rooms. The following day, World Magazine reported that D'Souza had admitted to McFarland that he did indeed spend the night in the same room with his fiance. D'Souza then claimed that nothing happened. When questioned on how he could be engaged to one woman while still being married to another, D'Souza had no explanation other than to say that he had done nothing wrong. Benjamin E. de Tanlin, father of three from Georgia, defended the killing of his five-month-old son with verses from the Book of Proverbs, but he eventually pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and multiple counts of child abuse in the death of his five-month-old son and the additional biblically-inspired physical abuse of his one-year-old daughter and two-year-old son. E. de Tanlin cited two sources from Proverbs. First, Proverbs 13:24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasten him be times and Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Withhold not the correction from the child, for if thou strike him with a rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with a rod, and deliver his soul from hell. Edith Tanlin faces 18 years for the involuntary manslaughter and child abuse charges. His wife, who allegedly does nothing to stop the abuse, also faces charges. During the latest senatorial elections, Indiana Republican candidate Richard Murdoch made news when he claimed that if a raped woman becomes pregnant, it's because God intended for it to happen. This statement enraged not only liberals, but even people in the evangelical camps. Although the politician tried to apply the evangelical belief that God's sovereignty is without limit, he discovered that it is a religious principle that is extremely difficult to apply in some cases, especially when it involves tragic events. Presbyterian minister and historian Gary Scott Smith expressed the opinion that the Calvinist would say that God has permitted bad things to happen, but we should not attribute them to God, even though God can bring about good things from them. And yet, according to scholar Peter Thusen, suffering is not meaningless. If you start restricting the scope of providence, that's a slippery slope to atheism. It calls into question whether there really is a God who controls all things. The team at the Infidel cannot help but wonder why there were so many religious people ready to condemn Mr. Murdoch, while very few seem to be willing to provide an explanation as to why bad things happen to good people. Mitt Romney's presidential bid brought attention to the fact that Mormons have quite a long history in Mexico and that Latinos represent a large portion of the LDS church members. His grandparents, for example, were polygamists who found refuge in Mexico fleeing the American ban on polygamy. His own father was born in Mexico in 1907 but the 1913 revolution and violence drove his family back to the United States. When his grandparents arrived in the Colonia Juarez in early 1884, they were not necessarily the first Mormons in Mexico. According to Fernando Rogelio Gomez, Brigham Young had already sent missionaries to that country. Gomez bases his claims on historical documents he found in his aunt's house. Among his many treasures, he has maps showing the location of the first church branches and original copies of the Book of Mormon translated into Spanish. Today, Mexico has nearly 30 missions, 220 stakes, and 12 temples. In the last 60 years, we have had over 1 million members, so it's really a fantastic history, says Mr. Gomez.